Starting this week, I'm going to be following a different format. I'm uh, taking out a lot of the uh, small detail that I had uh, been uh, mentioning. I don't think it's it's relevant going forward. So we're going to change our focus to uh, duration and beta, which are uh, really your top-down factors. Let's have a look at the economic calendar from last week. Um, and I'll just highlight some of the important things. Monday, China, uh, trade information, exports year over year up 2.4%. Uh, Previous was 87 The consensus was 6 so that's uh, quite a miss. Imports, uh, 03 <clears throat> The consensus was a 0.9, previous was 0.5, so, uh, and this is for September. Now, this is before the uh, stimulus announcement, uh, so we can see that probably it was needed. Later in the week, we got a big data dump from China on uh, housing price index, uh, uh, GDP, industrial production. Let's uh, move over to Tuesday. Uh, Canada, inflation rate. 1.6%, the core 1.6, month over month, <clears throat> you are firmly in deflation, previous month negative 0.2, here is negative 0.4, uh, the core inflation month over month is flat, uh, <clears throat> so the Bank of Canada meets in uh, three days, so there's some thinking that it has permission to do a 50 basis point cut, they've already done three for 75, I just don't know that that it's the Bank of Canada, it, it, their character to do 50, uh, but they might. They do 25, that's positive uh, for interest rate sensitive uh, sectors uh, of uh, Canada, utilities and REITs. If they do 50, that will be a really big boost for utilities and REITs and a big drop in the dollar. Well, you might see 139 on the Canadian of which I would step in and buy. Okay, uh, let's move to Wednesday, and let's look at the UK inflation rate, 1.7%. Now, the core year over year is 3.2, but you have to look at month over month, 0.1. So you're just uh, running off some base effects from the previous year. But 0.1%, the headline month over month, 0%. Look at PPI. Uh, zero. This is uh, month over month, year over year, 1.4 on output. Input, negative 1, negative 2.3. You have deflation here on the month over month, negative 0.5, negative 0.7. Uh, next, uh, U.S. mortgage applications for October 11th, <coughs> negative 17% uh, because we did have a uh, rise in longer term yield, so a rise in uh, the mortgage rate. Negative 17% drop in mortgage applications. Also, this is interesting here for the U.S. Export prices month over month, negative 0.7. Uh, previous month was negative 0.9. Expectation, negative 0.4. Drop to negative 0.7 here. Import prices, negative 0.4. Uh, year over year, negative 2.1. Negative 0.1. Export import prices. Lots of uh, no inflation or deflation. Uh, when we get to retail sales, I'll talk more about uh, U.S. inflation, what is remaining, uh, <clears throat> and how interest rates are simply not going to solve it. Uh, interest rates have solved what interest rates can solve. Let's go to Thursday. Uh, we have uh, CPI uh, in the Eurozone, uh, inflation rate year over year, 1.7%. If we look at inflation rate month over month, negative 0.1%. The core year over year is uh, 2.7, uh, but some base effects, uh, some base effects in there, and that has been coming down. If we look at the uh, the chart, look how that has uh, really come down over time. Uh, so that is uh, fading away nicely. <clears throat> Interest rate decision. It was a cut of uh, 25 25 basis points. U.S. retail sales, 0.4%. We look at X autos, 0.5%. Uh, so it was a fairly strong read. The expectation was for 0.3. The previous month was 0.1. You have 0.4%. Uh, <clears throat> now, I want you to keep in mind something. When we look at CPI, where do we see deflation over the last year? We see it in goods. 
Retail sales is primarily good, so you have strong retail sales, but no inflation. Where you have inflation in the U.S. is in services and in particular domestic services. Three big categories. Still some uh, residual in housing, insurance, and health care. How do you reduce demand for housing, insurance, and health care? Uh, higher rates aren't going to reduce the demand for health care. You need it, you need it, period. Have, a, have rates as high as you want. You're not going to affect demand. The only way to fix that is to fix supply. Insurance. <clears throat> higher rates aren't going to change insurance. You're not going to get people to stop buying insurance uh, for vehicles because it's mandatory. You have no choice. You must buy it. Higher rates are not going to solve that problem. Housing. Higher rates will just keep supply off the market. Builders won't build because construction loans are too expensive, and homeowners won't sell because they're locked in at lower interest rates anyways. The three areas which are causing most of the domestic services inflation are things that interest rates cannot solve. You can't solve that. You can't keep interest rates high and say, oh, health care costs will come down. People will stop getting sick with higher interest. It won't happen. And um, from 2010 to 2030, you have the baby boom retirement uh, um, uh, phase, a 20-year 20 20-year, uh, uh, 20-year uh, generation here because it's 46 to 65 is the baby boomer generation. 10,000 10, people retiring a day uh, every day over that, uh, over that 30-year period. You now have 60 million people in the U.S. over the age of 65 and over the next 10 years, the next cohort of baby boomers, or the, sorry, the next six years, the last stretch of the baby boomers will be hitting retirement. You're not going to, to, to reduce demand for health care. Health care demand will only increase. You have to increase the supply. Higher rates aren't going to get that done. Lower rates may get that done by encouraging uh, venture capital investment into health care startups. Uh, and private equity money flowing into that space, but higher rates won't do it. So in the U.S., where we're seeing higher rates is is not uh, a, a, a problem that high rates can solve by reducing demand. You're not going to reduce demand for housing services. You need it. You're not going to reduce demand for insurance. It's mandatory legal that you must have it. You're not going to reduce demand uh, for health care. Uh, so I don't see why this Fed would pause because of one inflation reading that uh, that ticked up a little bit, and in particular in those three categories? No. <clears throat> look around the world. Uh, everywhere I look, I don't see inflation. I see uh, uh, inflation well below target, if not outright deflation. And that is the uh, idea behind the world we live in with technology is, is we do have a deflationary backdrop as technology becomes a larger and larger part of our lives. Retail sales were strong, but you have deflation in goods. So this, this just backs up my uh, belief that the uh, sell-off in, ye in uh, longer-term bonds, the rise in yields, is, is uh, uh, not substantiated by the data. Uh, where do we have next uh, Thursday? We At the very bottom here, we have Japan inflation, <clears throat> 2.5. It was 3%. The core, 2.4, it was 2.8%. Uh, month over month, ugh, they don't want to see that. They have fought for years to get rid of that negative sign. Look at that, month over month, negative 0.3. Uh, don't look for the Bank of Japan to be raising rates anytime soon. They got it just a millimeter this side of the zero line. Because if they're going to be a carry trade currency, may as well get some money for it. Uh, just this side of the zero line. They talk tough about raising rates, mostly to protect the currency, but they're not going to do it. There's that negative sign again. If that negative sign persists, look for them to do even more the other way. Not in talking tough, but in talking easy, because they need inflation, but they got a shrinking population. It's going to be hard for them to get inflation. The big data dump, China. <clears throat> Housing price index year over year for September, negative 5.7, followed on to a negative 5.3. Uh, from the previous month, that is just falling. So they, they, it's understandable why they felt the need to step in uh, and do so much for housing. GDP growth, their target is 5%, 4.6. Consensus was 4.5, so that's not so bad. Previous month was 4.7, but their target is 5%. 
Industrial production is a bright spot, 5.4%, uh, up from 4.5. So we had an expansion of 4.5, followed by an expansion of 5.4. Oh, sorry, this is year over year, not month over month. I take that back. 4.5 this year, uh, or this month for September 5.4, but I don't have the base effects in front of me, so I can't tell whether that was a base effect. Retail sales year over year, 3.2. Uh, GP growth, uh, quarter over quarter, 0.9. Still came in, you know, the 4.6. Uh, and that is it for, uh, for this week. I do, uh, on uh, Saturday, I believe it was yesterday, China did announce more stimulus, but it was primarily directed at uh, the stock market. It wasn't uh, directed to the real economy. It was directed to the monetary economy, the financial uh, side of things. So uh, China is something to watch going forward. But I want to point something out here. Uh, you have deficit spending across the world, uh, especially in the advanced countries. Deficit spending. I believe India has a lot of government spending as well. That if you uh, said, well, hang on a second, <clears throat> over the last four years, if we took all government spending, uh, all deficit spending, and made them all balanced budgets, what would growth, global growth, look like? Uh, there'd be no global growth. It would. It, you you have been in the pri if you if you take uh, GDP growth and you separate it into growth from private sources, growth from public sources, meaning. Uh, deficit financing, uh, you will find that, that we've been in a global uh, recession for four years if you back out uh, government spending. So let's take the U.S. thinking about uh, deficits of what four, five, six percent of GDP. Well, that has been nominal GDP, uh, basically. So if you look over the last year at uh, the U.S. in terms of GDP growth and you look at the uh, amount of deficit spending as a percentage of GDP, there is no growth. Uh, and I think going forward with China, there will be no growth. It will primarily be government, government growth. Uh, you can understand gold's allure at that point. And now if you are thinking, well, gold will pull back in price, you must also be saying, well, all these government deficits will pull back as well. We'll be start moving towards balanced budgets. And if you don't believe that statement, gold is only going higher. Okay, let's deal with duration. Look at, uh, look at our rates uh, and yields here. No change, no change, no change. A small one basis point change here, one basis point, one and one. This is week over week. Uh, pretty much ended right where we started. And I do believe that these yields on the long end of the curve are wrong. The long end is pricing in continued inflation and a Fed that's going to be more careful on the way down. I don't think that's true. I think you're going 25 at the next meeting and 25 in December. You're getting two more rate cuts <clears throat> this year because what is causing inflation in the U.S. cannot be solved with higher rates. There's no point. There's no point in fighting this fight because you're fighting the wrong enemy. It's got to be a supply issue. So I think that is uh, well overdone. Uh, look at that. No change on anything here 720 days now on the money market the capital market inversion Canada still inverted there but the uh, the capital curve uh, the 2 to the 10 is upward sloping Bank of Canada in three days so there is some currency risk if they go 25 I think the Canadian holds its ground maybe even strengthens a little bit if they go 50 you could see 139 I'd be a buyer there I'm already hedging out uh, some U.S. exposure into Canadian anyways. So I don't mind uh, doing a little bit more. <clears throat> but the, util the utility uh, and REIT uh, complex in, in uh, Canada should get a good boost. Same with the banks, should get a good boost. And I'm in all of those, so uh, I'll stay positioned for that. Last reading, remember, 1.6%. It does give them permission I just don't know if, if uh, after coming off 75 basis points of cuts, if, if they're going to say we need to accelerate this process. Remember their favorite word on the way up, right? Hey, don't, you know, get off our backs. This stuff works with a lag. 
Well, same with On the Way Down. Uh, FOMC, Thursday, November 7th, 18 days. Uh, the odds are on 25 basis points. I have a star here saying, I believe that's right. I think that's what you're going to get is 25. Uh, to not move, to, to not move, to take the zero, uh, would be to suggest uh, that uh, they made a mistake going 50. And, I, and I, I seem to think they should have done 25 in July and 25 in September. So, you know, I think they made a mistake in July. They tried to correct for it in September. They can't not cut now because it would look like, well, now that's two mistakes perhaps they've made. But look, uh, nobody knows anything about the future. We're all just making it up as we go. So I think that's what they're doing. But I do think the 25 is is in and in the press conference I don't know that he's going to say anything more than what he's already said look you know progress has been great uh or the things have come into balance uh, a little bit better uh we're we're da- we're going to watch the data as we go along and we don't get any summary of economic projections here but I think you got a 25 and a 25 this year I do think the long end of the curve is uh is wrong US election November 6 17 days it is looking like Trump has the edge here. Um, so the Trump trade could be a reality. The one thing that I'm kind of interested and excited about with Trump, uh, the projection is that he would increase the debt and the deficit far more than Harris would. Uh, you know, I, 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 I tend to agree that that he's his eye is probably not on the deficit or on the debt um but in in talking about government waste if he does follow through on bringing in an efficiency czar to cut costs uh and and you know the thinking is it's elon musk that would do it if he does follow through with that um there is huge amounts of waste in all government spending everywhere, you could probably uh, get a balanced budget just by saying, come on, we're spending $5,800 on a stapler? Come on, that, that, come on. I think you, you'd need somebody that could walk in and say, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired, no more spending on this. It might, <clears throat> it might actually be positive uh, for yields and it might actually be positive uh, for the U.S. dollar. That... Uh, Still needs to be seen. He's promising a whole bunch of stuff right now to get elected. Once he's elected, he's going to do what he wants to do. Uh, reverse repo. Uh, almost the lowest. $259 billion. Lowest was $239 billion reserves. $3.2 trillion. So at runoff, you have less than two years. I don't anticipate two years. I think that by the time we get into mid-next year, there'll be they'll be talking about, or at least at the beginning part of the year, they'll be talking about when to start talking about tapering. By mid-next year, that'll be the conversation. Maybe sometime in the third quarter, they'll begin to uh, uh, stop the uh, balance sheet runoff or reduce it a little bit more. For Fed funds futures, pricing at 121 uh, basis points, basically five rate cuts in six meetings. I don't see a trade there. I look at that and I think, well, yeah, I think that's, you know, eyeballing it. Yeah, it's, uh, that, that feels about right. And that's by the end of the second quarter. That's by the end of June uh, 2025. <clears throat> five rate cuts. Uh, which is why I believe duration is just wrong. Uh, I love duration right now. TLT up 0.19. Almost nothing for the week. Um, SPX up 0.85. Another... Well, I think we had two uh, record closings during the week, but Friday closed at another all-time high on this one. So we have duration under pressure and beta on a run, on a run so much that you have to start thinking about uh, how far, how far can it possibly go when we're trading it, and we'll see on the next screen, 22 times uh, forward earnings, and earnings estimates are not coming up to lower the multiple, the price is going up to increase the multiple, which is the wrong way. Okay, on to beta. And that is proxied here uh, with SPY. Forward four-quarter operating earnings, not the as-reported 
operating 265.72 down slightly week over week. Um, <clears throat> S&P Global just isn't keeping up with things. Let's uh, just drop them off. We'll just stick with LSEG. Uh, closing SPX 58.64. That puts it at 22.04 times forward earnings with volatility just dropping at an all-time high. I mean, what do we need to be worried about, right? Earnings are coming down ever so slightly. The market is going up. The multiple is increasing. Volatility is disappearing at all-time highs in front of an election and a Fed meeting. What's there to be worried about? Uh, <clears throat> what's going on with the other indexes? IWM. 226.70 is a 52-week high. That was hit last week on October 16th. All-time high is 241.67. you got to go back three years for that. But sitting uh, just under 7% below its all-time high. This has a component of about 40% unprofitable small cap. Quite a few of them were large cap that are on their way out, not small cap that are on their way up. So uh, to be... Uh, approaching all-time highs when this, the proportion of unprofitable companies is much higher now than it was on November 1st is ODD, right? Odd. Uh, IJR, that's the S&P 600, profitable small cap. 118.35 was their 52-week high. It was set this year, July 22nd uh, of this year. We closed on Friday at 118.15. 20 cents below the 52-week high and not far below an all-time high. 120.38, again, three years ago. We are less than 2% below an all-time high. Um, <clears throat> this is momentum. If we are looking for the fundamentals of it, we would we would certainly be looking at that forward multiple and saying, That's a, it's a bit rich. I mean, at these forward multiples, the forward expected return on the market would be lower. So if we think that uh, we have a certain price target, uh, or, or here's where we are today, let's draw a timeline, and that we have some price target in the future, which is a long-term return on the market, and you think, okay, well, we can get 13% uh, expected return. If you start pushing up the price, uh, your longer-term expected return uh, especially at 22, if you're going to trade at 22, uh, is lower, right? So you would expect at these levels, as the fundamentals catch up, uh, that you would have lower expected returns going forward. But here we are. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that you can ignore beta. You have to have some beta exposure, but that doesn't mean uh, you have to jump right in uh, to, to, uh, to the S&P 500 and grab that one. Let's see, uh, on the next screen, I'll show you some opportunities uh, that I think exist. Okay, let's uh, look at some top-down uh, broad trades. In each, in each of the four categories, you would need some bottom-up selection. Number one, uh, that if I had to only pick one, it would be U.S. duration. Fed funds are dropping. I do think you're going to get the 100 to 125 basis points cut by mid 2025 you do have a deflationary backdrop where you are getting inflation is in categories domestic service categories that you cannot solve with higher higher interest rates you're not going to reduce demand for healthcare services with higher interest rates not going to happen uh, i think uh by uh, uh the end of or mid sorry mid 2025 i think the effective Federal funds rate will be sitting, or the top end will be sitting at about 3.5%. And at that point, I think you have a flat money to market to capital market curve. In other words, the three month to the 10 year, I think will be zero, if not slightly upward sloping, but it will be flat to uninverted. Uh, so I, I, when I say that, it's because right now you have high rates and you have a slight drop in the curve. If you drop it down to 3.5, I think you get sort of a flat curve, which would make uh, your rates from the 10-year out to the 30-year, which are over 4%, would bring them down to 3.5. Uh, so I do, I do expect that to happen. And uh, just to look back here for a second, we have 4.08 on the 10-year. 
Uh, so call it 60 basis points downside by mid-2025. Uh, on the 30-year, 4.38. So I think you have 88 basis points of downside uh, by that time. And that's where TLT will be sensitive to. Not the 20-year. The 20-year is at 4.44. But from the 10 to the 30, you have this odd behavior on the 20-year. TLT is 20-year plus. The average maturity is 25.5. So the better... Uh, the better rate to look at is the 30-year, 88 basis points uh, drop, and, and TLT has a duration of about 16.5. So that is almost 100 basis points. So just you know, eyeballing this, you're looking at about a 15% upside. And I think that TLT right now is underpriced. 96, 97 would be, I think, a, a fair value on the yields for the long end of the curve. It's been overdone. 15% uh, up from, uh, let's say, uh, 96 is about $15. That gets you to about 111 uh, by uh, mid-next year. And that is, to me, that's sort of a base case. Uh, uh, not a best case. That's just, that's just a base case. So I can't get enough duration. I, I like duration. Number two, utilities, because I'm getting some beta in there. I got my duration, again, plus beta. And here you have multiple drivers on utilities. Data centers take huge amounts of energy. Uh, crypto mining. Both Harris and Trump have said, uh, 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 have you know put some support behind the idea of crypto. Uh, with Trump saying everything he can say. Uh, to raise money from those guys. Whether he means it or not, I don't know. I don't think he really cares, being that the Trump kids are doing something with crypto. I'm sure he'll do something there. Uh, so crypto mining, which is energy intensive, you have the transition uh, and expansion of the grid, transition to greener forms of energy, and you're going to have to expand that grid. Lower rates uh, are one part of it. Significant asset growth coming up, and it's more tax-efficient income than bonds. Uh, grabbing some of this because it's a dividend, not interest. Uh, if you uh, don't quite understand utilities in the applied series, understanding electric utilities uh, gives you a good understanding of how utilities make money. They make money off of asset growth. Uh, they are regulated entities uh, that are uh, the their income statement is designed to deliver them their cost of capital. So they, they do make money, period. Uh, they make more the more assets they have, not the more they charge. They're, what they charge is regulated. It's asset growth, and you have significant asset growth. So utilities gets me some beta. Copper. Uh, let's go to number three, copper and gold. Gold is just a pure alpha play. Uh, copper is both a beta and an alpha play uh, if you're playing it with miners. Um you're going to have a supply issue uh, going forward if you are bullish on uh, utilities because of significant asset growth. Whenever you move an electron around, you need copper. Uh, so uh, given the level of mines in the world and the yields, uh, the production yields right now, if you uh, hope to meet the demand for copper, you need to increase supply. There are not enough mines to get that done. Uh, which means the price would have to go up because mines have reserves and it has resources. Reserves are commercially viable. Resources are geologically viable but commercially unviable. To turn resources into reserves, which are mineable, you have to get the price up. The higher the price goes, the more those resources become reserves. The price has to go up. Uh, you have uh, infrastructure build-outs uh, and, um, you know, in places like Mexico and India and in the U.S., significant infrastructure replacement and digitization. Again, anytime you have uh, a digital uh, or moving into a digital world, bits and bytes have to move around. They need energy to move around. You need copper. Maybe, I say maybe China, maybe China. We've seen copper inventories at Shanghai Exchange really drop over six months. If China's serious about 5% growth, they'll provide more and more stimulus going up to 5% growth. Well, that's going to require some inputs. 
Uh, and if you don't quite uh, get uh, how copper mining works in the applied level, I've done a video for understanding copper mining. Gold. Um, this is pure alpha because I, uh, you can get it with beta as well by going into gold miners or you could just use the gold futures contract. Uh, lower yields per ton has been the trend over quite some time. So uh, for every ton of ore pulled out of the ground today, there's less and less gold and that has been going on and will continue on. Central banks are uh, buyers, bigger buyers of gold. Uh, you have mounting global debt and um, a running deficits as far as the eye can see that the vast majority of global growth is government financed which means increasing money supply across the world uh, which at the heart of it on a on on just a naive pass you would say is inflationary so gold is going to get a bid i think we live in a deflationary world but that doesn't matter it's what everyone else thinks, right? And if you have increasing money supply, if you know, the logic is, well, governments can print whatever they want, but you can't print gold. You can only take out what exists. Uh, that will continue to rise. Uh, I put in brackets here, public spending is roughly about 100% of global growth. That global growth exists because governments take money uh, from savers and spend it. At some point, they got to go to all the people who have capital and take it from them to pay it back, right? Also on the applied level, understanding gold mining will help you with this one. Uh, so number three, cybersecurity. Uh, notice that uh, uh, with uh, uh, utilities, it's the rise of data centers uh, that that is one of the growth drivers. And with copper, it's continual digitization. Uh, well, with all of that, if we are going moving to a more digital world uh, with vehicles that can talk to each other, with migration into the cloud, uh, with work from anywhere, with any device, you're going to have to secure it all. With advances in machine learning and AI, we don't get to pick and choose who gets to use that. If you sell an AK-47, a good guy can buy it, a bad guy can buy it. So if the bad guys are buying it, the good guys got to buy it. So if you have AI and machine learning and the bad guys are using it, the good guys got to use it. Plain and simple. Uh, continue cloud migration. Increasing threat landscape, uh, which means more devices in more places, more Internet of Things. Just think about what a building has. Uh, it has uh, swipe cards, door swipes, thermostats, uh, the full AC, uh, alarm systems, cameras, all connected to the internet. These are all ways in uh, for a bad guy. Those are all the different ways in. That's, that becomes part of the threat landscape. AI by bad guys, you have to have AI by good guys. And again, that explosion of internet of things. And with cybersecurity, I would go with size only. And I would go with companies that have both hardware and service. Not just a, a service one, but hardware and service. Uh, the video for understanding cybersecurity will be up at the end of the month. These are my four big ones. Duration, uh, utilities, which gets me some beta, copper, which gets me some beta and alpha, gold for pure alpha, and beta and alpha in cybersecurity because I do think over the next four or five years, cybersecurity will outperform the broader market uh, on, uh, uh, on performance. I thought it might be interesting to take a look at Netflix's earnings uh, from last week because they had quite uh, a jump, 10% up for a $700 stock and they had $770. Uh, so uh, what's the big deal? What's going on? Um, let's. Uh, this is a chart they provide. Uh, this is Q3 of 2023. This is Q2 of 2024. So this is uh, year over year for the quarter. Uh, just look at year-over-year year growth, 7.8, 12.5, uh, up to 14.8, 16.8, 15. So it is a, a step up, and it's pretty pretty much coincides uh, with when they said they were going to start cracking down on password sharing. That it actually increased the number of subscribers they got, uh, increased their growth. Uh, same with operating margins, 22.4, 16.9, then a jump up to the high 20s. 
Uh, and if we look at diluted EPS, 373, 211, and then a big jump up, you know, 528, 488, 540, 423. I don't know if that big jump up can be replicated again. What would you do? Well, once you crack down on password sharing, once you uh, get all of those other people to say, ah, well, you know what, it's not that much. I may as well pay for it. Where's the next big step up like that? And I think there's some excitement about looking at the uh, year over year for the quarter because you went from 373 uh, per share to 540 per share, uh, some 45% increase in saying that's incredible growth. But, you know, on a going forward basis, are you still going to get that? If I look at uh, the full year, they've given a uh, forecast for Q4 full year, 38.8 billion operating income of 10.3 billion is an operating margin of 26.58%, net income 8.7 billion. That is a net income margin of 22.34, that is healthy. Uh, and they're forecasting revenue growth to be in the neighborhood of 15%. Return on equity annualized, because they do have uh, about 18 billion in debt, 52 billion in assets, 18 billion is debt, 22.7 is their equity, uh, and I'm gonna annualize it 40, 0.16% return on equity. <clears throat> That's not too shabby, right? Return on assets, uh, controlling for the capital structure, 17.45, uh, which is very good. If you cash adjust that, 21.19. Uh, there's no arguing. The fundamentals are, are certainly there. Is it worth 32 times forward earnings? If you have uh, an estimate of forward earnings, about $24.00. Uh, which is a 20% increase, a little over 20% increase uh, from uh, where we are. Uh, actually, it's more like a 25% increase, sorry, from uh, the $20 that you would get uh, through 2024. 24. Uh, you would uh, multiply that by 32 to get to the current stock price. So that is your forward multiple 32 times. Uh, going down a little bit here, uh, membership, paid memberships, 282 from 247. This has never gone backwards. It's always just gone up. Maybe it's gone up, you know, at different growth rates, but it's always gone in one direction. It's a very inexpensive uh, service to have. Most people will have four or five different services. Uh, and if you have to cancel, I think Netflix would be last on the list. I have Prime. And uh, I see no point in it. Uh, you know, I look at it and I think, well, why would I continue paying for this? It doesn't, I'm not going to cancel it. But if I were, uh, you know, um, on an income, uh, let's say, uh, you know, earning a paycheck and I wanted to tighten my belt, uh, it would be one of the things that would be an easy decision of the streaming services. Okay, let's get rid of that. Apple, a year ago I would have gotten rid of, now less so, but Netflix seems to be the core. I don't know that anyone really gets rid of that one um, first. Year-over-year -year growth, you know, 10%, 12%, and then password crackdowns, uh, and you had this nice little jump up. That's what I'm suggesting is I don't know that that's replicable, that, that to say that you're going to continue with 15% growth just because you've seen that over the last three or four quarters, you'd have to pull out something else that, that gives you a big membership boost like that as well. They've pointed to the lineup of things they have coming up. The Jake Paul, Mike Tyson fight, the uh, two Super Bowl, that's uh, not Super Bowl, the two football games at uh, uh, Christmas, a strong lineup going into the quarter uh, will bring more people in. And I tend to agree. If you can bring in big events like that, uh, Jake Paul, Mike Tyson, I wouldn't mind watching that. So uh, I'm not a Netflix subscriber, but I, you know, I'd look at that thing. Well, you know what, for the cost, why not do it? And I get to see this. So if they can continue to do that, then uh, uh, bring in compelling programming like that. This is interesting here. If we look at, uh, for a long time, uh, Netflix was negative uh, uh, free cash flow. Uh, uh, in a, uh, sorry, in a negative free cash flow situation. They have positive free cash flow now. But we look at uh, cash provided by operating activities. And you look at net income. Uh, CFO is below net income. 2.3 billion, 2.2 billion, 2.1 billion, 1.2 billion, 2.364, 2.2, 2.3, 2.2, 2.3, 2.2, 2.3, 2.2, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3,
three, two, one, that uh, you usually want to see your CFO above your net income, your cash being stronger than your accrual. Here, the accruals are stronger than cash. Uh, their argument is the additions to content assets are greater than the amortization of content assets. So uh, for the nine months ending, we had net income of 6.84 billion, cash flow from operations of 5.82. This little thing here amounted to 654 million. Cash flow from operations is a billion dollars lower than net income. And if we accept this, say, okay, well, that's why it is. Uh, that was 654, so there's still another 350, uh, 350 million uh, by which cash flow from operations was lower than net income. So do we have some strong accruals going on here that is uh, pushing those earnings per share? For free cash flow, you are free cash flow positive. Uh, within this nine months, there was 5.3 billion of share repurchases uh, year to date with 3 billion left. Uh, if we look Q3 2023, 450 million shares down to 437.9 million shares. That's part of your return. Uh, is the decrease in share count. The decrease in share count with flat earnings will push earnings per share up. So this uh, money over here could have been returned with dividends. It's being returned to shareholders with uh, stock repurchases, which is uh, uh, in part pushing up earnings per share. Uh, I think that will continue. I think they'll continue to buy back stock. Uh, there is no um, damage on this company anywhere that you could point at and say, oh, well, let's watch out for this. Let's watch out for that. I think they're firmly entrenched in the streaming business. I think their share, uh, their uh, subscriber count will only increase. I'm not sure if I'd say at the 15%. I think they're the last ones to get canceled if there was ever a problem. I think the other streaming services would fall off first. Netflix seems to be the must-have for streaming services. The question you have to ask yourself is, is it worth 32 times the forward earnings? Uh, when Netflix gives guidance, they say, uh, very plainly, we strive for accuracy, not conservatism. So that their forecasts are not meant to be conservative forecasts that they beat. They're meant to be accurate forecasts that they meet. Um, which could be a little bit aggressive. I, uh, I'm not with them on the continued 15% growth. I think that you had a nice little boost uh, because of the password sharing crackdown. I think you get a couple more quarters out of that. But if I were valuing this, I certainly wouldn't have uh, a 15% growth rate over a longer term, maybe uh, for the next year and then tapering down to something uh, more reasonable. As you get bigger, that 15% is harder and harder to keep. Um, and as the price of, if they're going to push into sports, they're not really into sports yet. If they're gonna push into sports, the content cost for that is astronomical. Uh, and you have a lot uh, of, of different places that are pushing into sports right now. I don't know that you'd end up with the same margins uh, on that. But there's Netflix, uh, good company, good earnings, good results, good growth, good margins, good return on equity, good return on assets. All of that is good. Uh, 32 times forward earnings, I think, is it's priced in. Um, but you do, have, you do have a name that has momentum behind it. It wouldn't surprise me if this continues to go up. Uh, into uh, into the end of the year, especially with the good strong lineup they have for the fourth for the fourth quarter, and I think that's how we think about Netflix. Is it's a quarter by quarter decision as to what you want to do. The week coming up, uh, other than uh, Canada Central Bank, uh, I think in the U.S. you have durable goods. the uh, The big thing this week uh, is the um, ending of the regional banks uh, on earnings and the beginning of tech. Uh, you have over a hundred reporting this week. I'm using uh, the earnings calendar from Sector Spider Monday. You just have a steel company, Nucor. Going to Tuesday, uh, I prefer to rank them, uh, to order them by sector, so I could just pay attention to what uh, I'm interested in. Freeport on Tuesday uh, for you copper miners out there. Uh, Verizon, we're getting into the telecoms uh, this week. They tend to 
uh, reported in a row Verizon, AT and T, uh, and uh, T Mobile. So we have uh, Verizon. You have some financials, uh, XLI, uh, if you are into the industrials. Uh, Texas Instruments, uh, Seagate. Texas Instruments will be uh, kind of an interesting one to see in the uh, chip sector. Uh, and uh, for home builders, uh, you've got NVR and Pulte and General Motors thrown in there. That will be an interesting one. Let's see what their guidance is. Let's go into Wednesday. Uh, Newmont. Uh, there's another miner. I have both Freeport and Newmont. So we have Tuesday and Wednesday, and there is AT and T and T Mobile uh, for the uh, for the networks. Uh, a few more financials in here. Some industrials coming in. Let's look at our tech and see what we have. Service now. That is a high flyer. Uh, Lamb Research. IBM. Uh, for Staples, you have Coca-Cola, Nextera. I do have uh, exposure to Nextera as well. Here's an interesting one, Tesla. I uh, I'd like to say I you know I don't expect it to be good, but I just never know with this company. And even if it's not good, uh, I don't think the shareholder cares one single bit. Uh, you had a disappointing robo taxi event. The price fell, but held at 220. Uh, another fatal crash with uh, f the uh, uh, full self-driving enabled. Now NHTSA has opened an investigation on something like 2.1 million vehicles in the U.S. That's not good, but the price did nothing. The price did nothing. As more and more information came out that the robots at the, uh, at the robo-taxi event were actually guided by humans sort of, uh, you know, off to the side, nothing didn't really care, didn't really matter, and I don't expect much out of earnings. I think most of their volume uh, was achieved with discounting uh, and uh, with uh, uh, incentives. Uh, so look for pressure on their margins. I don't look for expansion on their margins at all, but is it going to matter? Right? I, I, I don't know. This is, uh, this is uh, you know, beyond a stock I've said before, you know, it's the cult of Musk, and and that's all that matters, it seems. Going into Thursday, uh, more financials uh, finishing up uh, for financials. Lots of industrials going on here. Um, for uh, XLK, VeriSign, and Western Digital. Uh, in real estate, digital. Uh, Wirehauser, which is a timber, uh, a timber re utilities DTE, and you got some healthcare. Uh, Pool Corporation, uh, that is a sort of a home building adjacent. And for Friday, uh, not much on Friday. You can also click in uh, each week, right? You're going into the next week. There's a lot of. Uh, this is a big week. And a lot of the big tech companies are in that week. Apple, uh, for example, uh, is in that week. Amazon is in that week. Uh, Microsoft, that is another big week as well. And there you have it.